what's right Let's rock this planet of ours and unite And listen to the radio Turn up the power of music Hey everybody, I am Rocktavia Rose with Rock News UK And why don't you go ahead and tell me who I have on the line with me today Yeah, this is Greg from Cats in Space Yes so i have a partner over in the uk his name is andy and he sent me some information about a band he's yeah. like check out this band cats in space i think you really like it and i pop on to spotify and i played a couple songs and i'm like okay this kind of has some like queen flavor and it's funky and it's cool and i'm like okay let's go i'd, I'd love to do them okay. in the video so um, here we are. That's what led to everything today. Um, <laughs> old Andy. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for taking the time out of your day to have a chat with us here. Um, I am over in the U.S. I'm in Chicago. Um, okay. Yeah. So, a lot of people. Chicago doing? What's that? How is Chicago doing over there with all the COVID nonsense? Oh. Uh, um <laughs> we just had a huge music festival called Lollapalooza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh and yeah, I mean, I wish I could have gone, but they just after that reinforced the mask mandates for a lot of the indoor venues here. So oh. Um, I'm just hoping everybody can just be kind of like wise about everything so we can keep the music flowing. Mm. That's just my, that's my hope. I hope we can all pull it off. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a mess, isn't it, really? I mean, no one knows what's going on half the time, I don't think. Yeah. So, um, getting back to it, over here is not too bad. It's kind of getting back to normal because obviously we're out fairly soon, but there's still so many people that are just... You know, they're just reading into so many different things. They're just kind of a bit worried about going out still. It's farming, really. Yeah. Um, I know you guys were, you were kind of locked down a little bit longer than everybody in the U.S. So uh, you guys had Freedom Day recently, didn't you? Yeah, it was, and that was delayed by three weeks, I think. So that's affected at the time we've had to sell tickets for the tour but yeah we've been pretty much locked down since last march so that's what nearly a year and a half Yikes. it's just madness good thing about us was though because like we've we work remotely in a, a studio in a in a forest pretty much it's like a farm um and it's right in the middle of nowhere so apart from the first five weeks last year we've been able to come and go into the forest to carry on recording so Personally, I haven't really felt it apart from the lack of gigs, but the rest of the time we've been fine. So, yeah, yeah one of the fortunate ones, I guess. So, uh, speaking of gigs, yeah, <laughs> let's jump into everything. Um, I was kind of wondering what your music journey was like growing up. Um, what really turned you on to music, to getting passionate about it to the point to where you wanted to become a musician? Okay, that's a good question. Something <laughs> like, uh, well, I've, I've got two older brothers, and my eldest brother, who's seven years older than me, he was, all he ever went on about was music when he was kind of, ooh, I was really young. I was probably five, five or six, maybe. So I can just about remember when the Beatles broke up. Oh, wow. So I remember Hey Jude and Let It Be and... Yeah. And Cheryl, <laughs> Long and Winding Road, which are all like, you know, such incredible songs but he but he was um my brother he's a, he a bit of a weird one because he loved easy listening music like andy williams <laughs> and um lulu and uh, the carpenters who i absolutely love the carpenters but then he also to keep in with the kids at school he'd go out and buy like you know deep purple fireball or Uriah Heep, Demons and Wizards or something. So he had this really eclectic music taste, which I kind of soaked up and I just loved all of it. So obviously then Glam Rock came out in the UK, which we all really liked. And me and the two brothers were out kind of buying all the records. So I was fortunate that I kind of grew up really early on 
loving kind of that kind of music. And my dad was a guitar player as well. He was a jazz guitarist, which, you know, wasn't really my cup of tea. But obviously seeing him play the guitar and take his amp out every weekend was obviously a big thing as well. And that's all I really wanted to do, uh, you know, either that or football. And I wasn't really, I was quite a good footballer, but I was never into football as much as I was music. And music yeah. was always there for me. So since about five years old, I've kind of always wanted to do music. Crazy. So you said you were into a, you said you were into a lot of glam rock. Who was your favorite? Um, well, The Sweet was my favorite band. So there's, um, and Slade, um, don't know if you remember Slade at all, but um, The Sweet were the main, the main band that I kind of grew up really getting influenced by. And then Queen came out and then Queen kind of took over. Um, yeah, and then obviously got into rock music like, you know, Thin Lizzy and Kiss and yeah. Rush and UFO and that kind of stuff. So yeah, all the good stuff. Definitely the good stuff. Um, what was your first band experience like? Like everybody has that, like your, your first band, like everybody has like, some people have like little garage bands that they get into or they have like family situation where, you know, you start a band with a brother and a cousin or something like that. So what was your first band situation like? Um, I, when I was at school, so this was like uh, Christmas time when I was about 13, I got like my first electric guitar for Christmas, like a little cheap guitar from Woolworths, you know, as we all did back then. And a friend of mine at school who I'd known since I was probably five years old, we were like really good buddies. He just so happened to get a bass guitar at that Christmas. So we got together and just kind of learned our instruments at the same time. And he was like a genius. He, he has turned into like a real jazz genius. He can play anything pretty much. But back then, we were just trying to be the new Lennon and McCartney, writing songs before I even knew what guitar chords were. But it was good because it, it, it taught me straight away that what I really wanted to do was try and invent music rather than just try and copy something off of the telly or listen to records and copy whoever. I, I wasn't really interested in that. I wanted to write my own songs and words. And yeah, we did that from about the age of 14 and uh, did a few little gigs around our kind of local town um we did our first gig was a church harvest supper of all things <laughs> and because we used to rehearse in the church during the holidays the deal was was it like had, a metal feel where you're you're playing like harvest supper in church and you're just like oh, melting uh, faces or no we were quite we weren't tame but we were we did um an eddie cochran number like a rock and roll number i think it's bebop or lula i think it was and then we did a song that we wrote, which was quite kind of, it was quite rocky, but it was quite tame as well, I guess for the time. This was, yeah, we, we hadn't really got the equipment to be able to crank it up and do all the distortion. Ah. <laughs> Although I was into Thin Lizzy and Kiss by that time, I didn't have the gear to make it sound like that. That came kind of a little bit later, but yeah, we had to do a gig for them as part of the deal of being able to rehearse in their church hall in the holidays. So. These little old ladies were sitting down, kind of with their handbags, kind of watching these four kids go up and make a racket. But it was good fun. And then we used to do like parties around like people's houses on a Saturday night, and we'd we'd set up in the conservatory and you know put a load of songs together and play a couple of covers, but mainly play our own stuff. Because back then, like back in the like the late seventies. There weren't tribute bands or covers bands. People just went out and played their own music. And that's how all the kind of the new wave of British heavy metal came about and all the rock thing from the like 1979, 80, like Iron Maiden and Def Leppard and all that stuff. It all came out of just the fact that bands played their own music. They didn't play covers. Of course, nowadays, everyone wants to be in a tribute band. And, you know, it's, it's gone the other way, unfortunately. But yeah, back then you played your own songs and hoped that people liked them. And, Maybe at the end of the night you did Highway to Hell by ACDC or something, and, and that'd be it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I love that you uh, you guys started basically like just singer-songwriter style, like doing your own stuff, not trying to cover too much stuff. 
Yeah, that's no, really impressive, actually. Yeah, I mean, my English teacher at school used to like say, you know, what do you want to do when you leave school? And I said, I'm going to be a musician. He said, you've got no grasp of reality. That was my last <laughs> oh, Yeah, my last school report was he has no grasp of reality. I'll I never forget that. Oh. And, um, I was always, I was pretty good at school, but, and he said, well, who, you know, how do you write words in? I said, well, it's kind of poetry put to music. and. I learned poetry through through school. You know. Yeah. Me bemused to say you're just mad, you know, on another planet, you know. I thought, well, I proved you wrong, and I did. So, you know, that's that's how it was. So yeah, we just I wasn't interested in I don't think I had the patience to learn other people's music anyway, because because back then there was no YouTube or video, just you had to learn it off the record by playing it backwards and forwards and slowing it down and you know, all my mates were going, Oh, I can play whole lot of love by Led Zeppelin or I've learned to go to heaven. I'm like, yeah, but that's been done. You know, I, I don't want to learn Jimmy Page. I'd rather write a song that's like it. And right. Be my song, you know, and then I've always been a bit like that, really. Yeah. So <laughs> I kind of, I, I can completely understand where you were coming from there with uh, mm -hmm. being in school and like kind of wetting your whistle with poetry written word and stuff like that. I used to be really, well, I still am, really long-winded because I read a lot of Shakespeare and I love poetry and Edgar Allan Poe. And like any time I pick up a journal and I try to write lyrics or stuff like that, I can feel that prose and like, I can feel a little bit of that stuff creeping in. So that I, I love that you mentioned that. I love that you uh, brought yeah. that up. <laughs> I didn't, re I didn't read many books, to be fair, but it just <laughs> from somewhere. I think I was more into cartoons on TV and <laughs> you know, like Hanna-Barbera, you know, Scooby-Doo and... Yeah, Top know, Cat. You, yeah, Top, top Cat. Yeah. yeah. Both my cats were named after Top Cat characters. So. No way, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, huge, yeah, huge Top Cat. And uh, Deputy Dog, remember Deputy Dog? You know, that yes. Thing. I like so we we had we had a lot of that feed come in where we would get like tons of like the Hanna Barbera stuff and the Looney Tunes even though they were really violent and it was kind of horrible and it's like kind of banned from circulation now but a lot of the Tex Avery stuff I loved how wacky yeah. it was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's really inappropriate the Tex Avery stuff. So <laughs> yeah. Roadrunner and stuff like that. Yeah, like, yeah. Jerry doesn't get anymore which is ridiculous you know that's because it's too violent yeah exactly exactly like you watch that stuff back when you're a grown-up and you're like oh yeah. wow okay i watched yeah. that as a kid hmm. yeah. <laughs> the kids are so influential now they're probably going to pick their cat up and start hitting it with a mallet or something so <laughs> You know, kids, <laughs> they'll do anything that's on the telly, won't they? So back then, we just used to find it hilarious, but you wouldn't go out and mistreat your pets because of it, you know. But, you right, know, but, but we could differentiate between, hey, this is a cartoon, this isn't, you know, and I, I guess I picked off more of the I'm kind of goofball, mm. the wacky side of stuff, but like it kind of, when you watch that stuff growing up, it still gives you a sense of whimsy. You still have yeah. that wonder and i think it translates into a lot of the artistic stuff that you oh, come come along with when you're down the road creating so it definitely comes into music if you're especially the kind of music that we do and the stuff that i've always liked has always been a bit psychedelic kind of crazy kind of yeah. cartoony you know <laughs> i'm not doom and gloom and kind of serious you know it's all done very tongue-in-cheek which cartoons were back in the day you know? hr puff and stuff you know, and the banana splits, you know, I, I love all that stuff. It's just, it's just good fun. It's just balmy, you know? And yeah. I think, I think that's what, there's not enough of that around nowadays. It really is isn't. Bad. No, I would watch a lot of Pee Wee's Playhouse. I would watch Pee Wee Herman a lot growing. He was one of my favorites, actually. I watched, like, we had something here that was in syndication um, called The Bozo Show. And I absolutely loved it. And it had a magician called Wizzo. And I don't know, it just... You, when you are actually a kid, you stay kid longer, you have that whimsical stuff. Like, again, it, it helps being a creative. It helps you with that imagination. You're, you're still like, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, I always say to people, I said, my head's like a Hanna-Barbera cartoon at the best of times because it's, it's good for the writing, you know. And it's, 
there's, like I said, there's not many people that do that stuff. And I think Jellyfish are an amazing band. With, they absolutely encapsulated all of that stuff in their two albums that they did, you know, and the, the image and the way they did the videos. And I mean, that was a massive inspiration to me in the early 90s, which I thought, wow, there's a band out there that's that crazy, you know? And I just love all that side of things, rather than the bands that are all serious and go out there and they kind of shout and detune their guitars and play at a million miles an hour, which isn't my cup of tea at all, really. Right. You know, fair play for doing it, but it's all a bit, I've always said that stuff, you have to box yourself into such a small brief. You know, you can only do this, you can only do that. You can't do that, I can't do this, because it's not right. Whereas what we do, we say there is no box. We can- Yeah, you know, that's that's perfect. Like when you, when, you're, when you don't listen to the like, hey, that's not right, you can't do that. You're supposed to do X, Y, Z. This is how it works in the music industry, X, Y, Z, blah, 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 follow this pattern. Yeah. But, what then when everybody else is doing that? Exactly, you've got to stand what? up and proud. <laughs> right. And we do, you know, that's why we have the name Cats in Space. People hate our name, but they don't forget it. <laughs> I think and it's kind of cool. Yeah, exactly. You know, a lot of, lot of people love it, or some people, the people that hate it are normally the radio stations that don't, don't get us, you know. Or it will be people that don't like our kind of music, which is fair enough. But the thing is, they remember our name. So there's a lot of other bands that they might not like as well, but they can't remember their name. They go, oh, that other band, but I don't know what they're called. They always remember Cats in Space. And also we said, what would be really cool is eventually people will get tired of calling us Cats in Space and they'll call us Cats. And that's what's happening. People now call us the Cats or Cats. Like Iron Maiden becomes Maiden, Deep Purple becomes Purple, Zeppelin. You know, people want to breathe the name yeah. down. And yes. we said, how good would it be if we get called Cats? You know, it's how short can you get the name? And it's 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 working. So we kind of have a little wry smile about that, thinking we got a, a funny name that some people don't like, but it's abbreviated with a very cool name. So it's <laughs> There's really nothing cool. I love more than when a band thinks outside of the box. It's Absolutely. very important to keep them guessing and keep people coming back. And exactly. I mean, there, I, 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 there are certain there's a certain sentiment where when bands get predictable that's kind of just their jam but like there's nothing more refreshing when you know you go into something you still have a little bit of that like hey this is our style this is us we're gonna stay true to us but then we're gonna throw you a curveball and you're gonna have even more fun than you normally have like <laughs> and that, yes. all the great bands did that you know that's why queen went on for so long and did so many amazing albums so led zeppelin and they, they kind of kept their core, but they also weren't frightened to go outside the box because the thing is with the with, with rock music, it's so generic, the style, that once you've done two or three albums, you you can't say any more than that unless you yeah. just repeat, repeat, repeat. And if you're really lucky, like back in the 80s, bands could repeat to a point, you know, like Judas Priest had a formula, you know, um, you know, Iron Maiden had a, a brilliant formula, but a very small formula, but my God, it worked for them. But one in a million bands can get away with that. Most bands, after four albums, they fall over because they've run out of stuff to do. But whereas we, we have, we're not like that. We'll push the envelope to do a disco song on one album. We, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we did that which people thought, oh no, what are they doing that? That's actually our biggest stream song on Spotify. That's what I absolutely love. I love when people are like, oh, what are they? Oh, mm. conniption pit. I'm gonna faint. They did something different. I don't like change. And then all of a sudden, it's huge. It's everywhere. Like it's the best thing that they've done so far. It's exactly. people and love it. Like, I'm like, what are you talking about? This is awesome. And then that person that was like, oh, in the beginning, they listened to it a couple more times, and they're like, wait a minute. Mm. All right, this is good. See, I told you, I love that. <laughs> right. I mean, people are frightened of change as well. So yeah. you know, the music stations and the magazines and stuff like that they're frightened of having to think a bit too hard about what it is they're listening to. So mm -hmm. they'll just go, no, can't bother, let's get someone, oh, I know what that is, that sounds like ACDC, that's great. Whereas if you've got to think too hard, then it's too much work for them. I Whereas, like to think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. it's what music's meant, music's meant to make a connection. Exactly. In some way or other, you know, and if you, in the sort of music that we do, you know, it's, um, it is very varied, it's not to everybody's taste, but, some people have commented and written into us and messaged us and 
come to the gigs and some of the comments they say about what our music has done and helped them with is totally overwhelming, you know. I mean, we had a guy only last week that only found us recently on the last out on the Atlantis album. And he immediately bought all the back catalogue and he got, became an Uber fan. Um, but he messaged to say, I think Atlantis is in my top five albums of all time and I rate it as high as A Night at the Opera by Queen. Which I went, how can you compare our album to Night at the Opera? I mean, that is like a, but to some people, the Sorry. album is strong. Yeah. I just had a motorcycle go by. <laughs> Hang on one second. You can okay. hear the, you can hear the road outside. Okay, repeat what you were going to say. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Did it all go dead then? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so this guy rated the album as highly as A Night of the Opera by Queen, which was like an amazing thing to hear. But if it, if it has that amount of emotional connection with some people, then, you know, it's fantastic, you know, because the, we like to try and make music have a lot of depth to it. So right. you don't have to like it and no one is going to like everything. But we do find that people do engage with our bands. They really engage with it. And they totally come on board with it, but it is, it is, it's not to everyone's cup of tea, you know. And like I said, if, if the magazines and radio stations that don't get it because it's too much for them, so be it. But other people do get it, so it's, it's it's good to have that kind of. I'd hate to be in the middle where they go, oh yeah, they're all right, and everybody in the world just says you're all right. I'd rather either no, we hate them or we love them. You know, no, no grey area. Let's have black or white area. Right. <laughs> <laughs> See, either way, you're gonna get it. You're gonna get attention. If you don't have haters, you're doing it wrong. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I said you might not like our name, but you won't forget it. And they say they won't say who's that band that does so and so. They normally say, oh, it's that Cats in Space lot. You know, or they'll say, oh, I love Cats in Space and. At the end of the day, our merchandise, which was a, a genius masterstroke from day one, if I do say so myself, we, we made this little cat helmet with ears and a little Oh, tent. I would love that! Yeah, and it's, it's all over our website. I mean, we sell a lot of merch because of it, to the point where we don't need to put our name to it. We can just put that cat helmet up and people know it's cats in space. Like Iron Maiden have Eddie, Eddie the Head. They put that up there. They don't need to write Iron Maiden about it. It's just genius marketing, you know. And we did it for a bit of a laugh as well. This is going back to when we started, you know. We didn't do this for any big master plan. It was just done for a bit of a tongue-in-cheek laugh. We're going to do one album, call it Cats in Space, put this funny kind of Hanna-Barbera cat helmet on the cover, shove it out there, and then see whether anyone likes it or not. And we were nervous because we thought, it's cost us a lot of money to do this. And then these reviews and these replies were coming in and we just couldn't believe what was going on. That people were absolutely going nuts over it. So we thought, oh, okay, we've got something good here. And then that cat helmet has just transcended over the whole of the, the journey so far. So it's, it's been really good. Awesome. So I have to ask you, as far as gigging is concerned, what is the best venue or your best experience gigging? Well, we were very fortunate to support Deep Purple a few years ago. Oh. And so, we, yeah, we got to play the biggest arenas in the UK. So we did the, the, the London O2, um, we did the GMEX in Manchester, we did the, um, what they call the, the, the massive one up there in Scotland as well. But doing the London O2 was a real big buzz. Um, I mean, we had a bucket list tick. Obviously, everyone wants to play Hammersmith Odeon. So we did that with Thunder and Status Quo in the same year. Um, London O2 is the big one. We ticked that off in the same year. And also in the same year, we managed to play Hyde Park in London, which was in front of uh -huh. uh, 85,000, something like that. Hey, that that's beautiful. Home. Yeah, that was... So we played the three iconic music places in the UK. And there's a few others, but those are the big three for us. And we did all of them in, in one year. So we were like really lucky. And obviously we want to go back and do it all over again. But those those would be the best gigs we've done, I'd say. But then there's lots of other great venues around the country as well. But I think to, to play Hyde Park and London O2 in one year was pretty special, yeah. That's awesome. Um, how did you actually end up getting your band together? Uh, I know, um, 
there's been changes. Have there been some changes recently in the band? Yeah, we've got, we got um, a new singer, a guy called Damien Edwards, who I've known for a few years, um, who toured with a, another band. Um, and he is an incredible singer. And I've known he's been, you know, we, in the other show, he's an incredible singer. And he's done um, uh, the War of the Worlds, um, live musical, don't you know that at all, the War of the Worlds, really big production. Um, and he's done you know, he's done everything from Elvis to Roy Orbison and awesome. he he's a chameleon. He can literally sing the phone book. And I, but I never knew that he was interested in doing like an original music and writing lyrics and stuff. And so when when the situation arose that we needed to get a new singer in, I kind of just happened to mention it to him. I said, Do you want to come and do some backing vocals on, on this album? Um, he went, oh yeah, I'd love to. So he came and done, did some backing vocals. And I, yeah, obviously I knew how good his voice was. But I got him to sing um, one of the songs, I got him to sing the lead line, just in one section of this one song called uh, Marionettes, I feel like I can tell. And I got him to sing the lead line because I knew it, would, it was right up his street. And he literally took the windows out. Literally, and I turned around to uh, my engineer Ian and he just looked at me, he went, good God, you know, what is this? And then so I said, can you sing the whole song? So he sang the whole song. And at the end, Ian turned back to me, he said, he's the best singer I've recorded in 40 <laughs> years. And Ian's done some pretty big people, you know, and he just said, he's astonishing, he's like a machine. And so I had a little chat with him and said, would you be interested in joining the band? Would that be something that might be suitable for you? And he went, Oh, well, I'm not doing nothing else because of COVID. He said, no one's gigging at the minute. He said, so yeah, I'd love to. So he came and sang all the songs and that's good, yeah. So that's how Dame's joined. Um, the rest of us, we just got together five, six years ago. We all kind of knew each other in a loose label roundabout way. Some of us knew each other better. Um, Andy, the keyboard player, Andy Stewart, me and him have been together for over 35 years. In various ah. so he's always been unfortunately he's <laughs> he's been dumped with me for all those years bless him um, Stevie Bacon the drummer he put the band together with me and he's like kind of my right hand man uh, on all the kind of managerial side if you like um, Dean Howard the guitar player who's in Tapau and Ian Gillen and he's done loads of stuff I've known Dean for Oh, donkey's years, yeah, 30 odd years. And we always said one day we'll be in a band together. So he, he came in. And then we got Jeff Brown, who was in the, the suite and has played with everybody and anybody. And I've never worked with Jeff before, but by pure fluke, when we were putting Cats in Space together, Jeff phoned me up out of the blue, recommended by someone, would I go and do a couple of gigs with him in Germany? And I went, oh, that's weird, because I was going to talk to you about it. So we got together in Germany and we were chatting about Cats in Space and what I was doing. And he said, oh, I'll come down and have a go. And because Jeff's also a lead singer as well. So we got two really strong voices in the band. And then we all got, the album was recorded kind of separately and a bit disjointedly as albums are. And then once the album was done, Dean said to me, you've got to take this out on the road, Greg. You've got to do some gigs. And yeah, I said, well, I'm not really interested in putting it on the road. That's a bit, a bit much. But we reluctantly said, well, look, we'll have some rehearsals and see whether we can do any of these songs live because they're a bit tricky. And we got into rehearsal room. Bam. Don't know what happened that day, but magic happened. Literally. Magic. It sounds cool, but it was a magical sound. And we just made this really good noise. And we all looked at each other and went, oh, well, here we go again, boys. We're back on the road. <laughs> Chasing that dream. <laughs> and that's how it started, yeah. So I have a kind of, it's not too weird, but a somewhat odd question for you. Um, seeing as how like your band has experienced like a lot of influential factors in the music business, have you yourself met a colleague or met anybody in the industry that you've actually been starstruck by? Oh, blind. Um... There's been very few, when I was younger, I think I would have been a bit more starstruck as you are, but I think at the age we are now, you kind of just, as you tiptoe through the business, you do tend to bump into the odd person. And after a while, it kind of becomes 
a bit kind of you're holding your own in that kind of arena if you like so you're not too I mean obviously the deep purple guys and they all turned up on the first day right it was okay because Dean had been in Ian Gillen's band so he goes oh Ian's turning up in a minute and then Ian came in and asked if he could borrow our ironing board so he could iron his shirt because he likes to iron before performance <laughs> Really? So knocks on the doors and oh, hello, is Dino in? I went, oh, hello, in they're coming in. And it's just like, and he's just sitting there chatting while he's set this iron board up. And like, that's Ian Gillen, you know. But no, I think the only, the nearest I've got probably would be, um, I think I, I briefly met Brian May at an event. Really? To go, yeah, he, it was a, a, um, a wild animal, wildlife fun thing, which he, he's a, very passionate about. Yes. And I, I was there as well and um, he came over, was doing the rounds, introduced himself to people and stuff. And he came round to this store that I was at and um, this big mop of grey hair kind of... Yeah. You know, <laughs> I just saw my childhood just walking up towards me and you know, I thought... That hair is the best oh. hair. Yeah. <laughs> he was such a lovely guy, but I only very, very... I didn't really speak to him, to be fair. Um, so yeah, that was a little bit of a cool time, that's Brian May. But if I think if I met Brian again, I'd be more nervous about him having to go at me for trying to rip him off. <laughs> <laughs> With the guitar playing and all the guitar harmonies that I do. And everyone says, oh, you're doing your Brian May again. You know, my, my engineer actually even bought me a pair of white clogs that like Brian used to wear. So I'd probably, if I met him again, I'd probably say I'm very sorry for doing what I do. <laughs> Please forgive me, Brian. I'm rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, I don't think, ooh, blah, I think it has to be someone like Kate Bush. I think I'd be a bit starstruck if I ever saw right. Kate Bush. Yeah. Unfortunately, all the other heroes of mine are dead. You know, Freddie Mercury, Phil Linnett. Yeah. Know. I met Gary Moore. He was obviously my biggest influence as a guitar player, as Gary Moore. And I've, I actually met Gary a couple of times and had a nice time with him. So I was, I'm very fortunate to have done that. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it really. I haven't really met anybody else, I don't think. Not really. Um, guys out of Europe were on the tour with Deep Purple as well, but didn't really speak to them, to be fair. Um, no, I think I think that's about it really. Yeah. So, now that you got your new lead singer and everything's kind of cooking along, things have been better over there across the pond. Mm. Uh, what's next for Cats in Space? Well, we start our tour on the 26th of August, finally, at the third attempt. Um, so finally we get to play right. the song off of Atlantis, because the album came out last year. Um, we were meant to go out on tour last September, and that got shelved. Then it got moved to March, and that got shelved, and now it's this September. So it's going to be amazing to do that. So that starts end of August. We've got a couple of festivals lined up. Um, I think three more festivals that we're playing at. And then the other festivals that we were meant to be playing, we're now going to be doing next year. We've got two headline festivals next year. Oh, hey. It's going to be really cool. And there's hopefully a couple of other things in the pipeline next year, which I don't want to goose by giving too much away, but, but if they come off, they're going to be proper bucket list ticks as well. Yeah. So we're like, one of them, I'm just like that, because it's, it's going to be brilliant if it comes off. Um, oh, now I'm so curious. <laughs> I know, I, I always do stuff like this. You know, I, can't, I can't, no, I'm not, I'm not allowed to say what it is, but it's it will be superb if it comes off. Maybe we'll um, just have to set up a follow-up interview or something. <laughs> yeah, well, that's definitely come back later on and I might be able to say a bit more. But um, And then obviously, we after the tour, we've, we're, we're in the studio recording the next album because obviously we're way ahead of everything. So. The next album's already planned for next um, early summer, depending on the vinyl manufacturing, because that's all a bit of a nightmare at the minute. So I'm in, right in the middle of um, recording that album and all the guys are coming in and out of the studio as we speak. So we're touring, recording the album, doing all the promo and doing that at the same time. And then obviously we've got Christmas coming up and we've got something lined up for Christmas here in the UK again, because. We like to put something out at Christmas because it's good fun. So we've got another thing lined up for Christmas, which will be revealed later on. Um, again, I'm not allowed to say what that is yet, but that's going to be really good. And then we'll be into next year and we'll be getting the promo ready for the next album. Probably, ooh, probably 
February, March time, I would have thought we'd start the promo for that. And Sounds like you're going to be proper busy if everything goes yeah, off without a hitch. Yeah, we're, we're full on. But I always say, you know, if you hang around while it's all doom and gloom and you wait for everything to open up again and then you start, you're so far behind. So far behind. Yeah. <laughs> got to plough through and I think what we decided to do last year was we made a conscious decision just to plough through hope for the best still try and give people some music to listen to and make the best of a bad situation which we did but not many bands did do that to be fair they just know we're seeing 2022 or whatever so we kind of thought well someone's got to do it so we've, we've been busy throughout and we we're always busy to be fair we've got special we do like these special vip events where the the super fans come down and watch us in the rehearsal room and we do like a special little show in the rehearsal room and they come along and ask us questions and you know we, we play some songs that we wouldn't normally play and we have a bit of a laugh and we do a raffle and sign a guitar like <laughs> brilliant we did it two years ago and it was the best thing any of us have ever done we all said that was the best thing because you're playing to like 55, 60 people, and they are just hanging on everything, and they just love it to such a degree, and playing the songs acoustically, you know. So it was such a success, we said we'll do it again next year. Of course, last year we couldn't do it because of COVID, but we have got it um, being lined up as soon as we can get it all, all ready for hopefully this year. So that's an exclusive, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> So that went by really fast. Uh, we're actually coming up on the end of our time together. Wow, um, that is... it went by fast, <laughs> didn't it? Uh, I, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, like, I normally end on kind of an off-the-cuff question, yeah. and I figured since I like the band sound and I love your name, and I've always been kind of like a star child anyway. Um, yeah. My weird question for you is: Do you believe in aliens? Well, that's a oh, that's going to open up a lot. That's another conversation entirely. That is, um, yeah, definitely, absolutely. I, I definitely think there's stuff out there, one hundred percent, and I think there's stuff on the planet, one hundred percent. I reckon. I can they, relate to that. They they walk they walk amongst us. I know there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there about lizards and shapeshifters and that kind of stuff, but they walk amongst us. I'm hundred percent sure about that. And there's definitely stuff up there. Yeah. I was kind of thinking about that the other day, like not just because I watched Men in Black recently. It's kind of a goofy thing, not not because of that. But um, no, I was thinking about how many galaxies and how many infinite like oh, situations like ours where there's potential for life out there. Plus, the there's also got to be cats in space out there somewhere, right? There's, there's some other the form of cat. cat. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Parallel universe, isn't it? We've got There'll be us somewhere else on another on the universe somewhere else. I don't know, but yeah, the Men in Black is great because you know, and it's spooky because a lot of those old films in the seventies and eighties, a lot of those bits come. Yeah, through. I used to. Oh, I love stuff like that. I love all those. Old, okay, we can go on a huge other tangent. No, you have a of worms there. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to thank you so much for your time. This has been one of the most wonderful chats that I've had about Total band pleasure. and band stuff and stuff on the docket. So, um, Good one, go Chicago. ahead. What's that? Good one, Chicago. Yeah. We want to that, <laughs> but I'm going to leave the floor to you really quick. Um, if there's anything else that you want to talk about to your international audience here in the U S as well as in the UK, um, if you want to plug any of your social handles or anything like that, um, I know you said you had the album coming up, but um, the floor is yours and then we'll sign off together. Absolutely. Yeah, just if anybody out there wants to check out the band, please do. Catsinspace.co.uk or Facebook. All our stuff's on there. Our website's really cool because there's loads of stuff on there. There's loads of stuff in the merch store. And have a listen on Spotify because if you like classic rock, we're there. All right, perfect. Thank you. As all these motorcycles go by, I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys, I love motorcycles, but I'm sorry if it's drowning everything out that I'm saying in the background. But, um, I am Rocktavia Rose, the Rock News UK, and this has been my interview with Cats in Space. What's up? Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Have a great one. I appreciate you. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.